1 Samuel chapter 4, beginning with verse 19. If you have your Bibles or if you have the Bible on your phone, I want us to believe God for his manifest presence, not just today, but going forward. Now his daughter-in-law, Phineas' wife, was with child, due to be delivered. And when she heard the news that the ark of God, the, of God was captured and that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she bowed herself and gave birth for her labor pains came upon her. And about the time of her death, the women who stood by her said to her, do not fear for you have borne a son. But she did not answer nor did she regard it. Then she named the child Ichabod saying the glory has departed from Israel because the ark of God has been captured and because of her father-in-law and her husband. And she said, the glory has departed from Israel for the ark of God has been captured. Heavenly Father, anoint this message today. Lord, I long to be in your presence. I long for this church to be a place where your presence is welcome. Lord, teach us to move beyond our preferences into your presence. Lord, teach us to sincerely long for your presence. Teach us, Lord, to seek your presence in all that we do. Lord, teach us to be empty vessels that can only be filled by your spirit and by the new wine available from your kingdom. Bless this word today and bless this house in Jesus' name. Amen. 1 Samuel chapter 1 is the birth of a judge and a prophet, a voice to a nation. It was a miraculous birth that came from Hannah's womb, who'd been previously told she could not have children. But she cried out in the tabernacle to Eli in the priesthood. Initially, they thought she was drunk. And she was drunk, but not with the wine of this world, but with the spirit crying out for a baby. And God granted her wish because she promised God, if you will grant me a son, I will dedicate that son, Samuel, to your kingdom. And I will promise that he will serve you. God granted that wish and the entire book of 1 Samuel could really be summed up in a few statements. The first statement would be that God will bring judgment on the disobedient. The second statement would be that God raises up leadership and he brings down corrupt leadership. He's a God that can raise up new leaders and bring down corrupt leaders. He's a God that's enough all by himself. He's a God that doesn't need our help in the judgment of the corrupt. He's a gracious God, but he's a just God, and we learn that throughout the book of 1 Samuel. We learn of Eli and his sons, Hophni and Phinehas, who were corrupt. His sons were demonic. They were taking the offerings from God's people and they were using it for their own gain. They were sexually immoral. They were making a mockery of the tabernacle right under their father's nose and their father Eli did not have the guts or the conviction or the character or the anointing to confront his sons. And I want to say this, Abba's house, what you tolerate will reciprocate and what you tolerate will replicate. And I want to begin with a confession. When I became pastor of this church, I thought that if I added program-minded people to a presence-driven people, that it would solve all of our problems. And I was wrong. And I ask you to forgive me. But I promise you, I won't make the same mistake twice. I'm looking for people who long for his presence. 
I don't care how many programs they can perform. I don't care how many titles they have. I'm done with religion. I want people that long for the manifest presence of God on this team and on this staff. One day when I have the grace to do it, I'll write a book about the hell I inherited and the mess I've had to deal with. But I don't have the grace to talk about it now, but one day I will, and I'll do it for the right motives, and that mo the motive will be to help other preachers. But I believe that where religion falls short is where the kingdom begins. If we will seek God in all things, he will show up for us. In 1 Samuel, it describes God's presence through the ark of the covenant found in the tabernacle. The problem was that their focus on the ark was so intense they forgot the God of the ark. And sometimes we can get so focused on religious activity or religious duty or even at times the word of the Lord that we forget the one who wrote the word. We forget the one who created the ark. We forget the one that turned water to wine. We forget the one that raised Lazarus from the dead. We forget the one that went to the cross, that got out of an empty tomb, that ascended to the heavens. We forget the one worthy of our praise and we long for that which is of this world, not the presence of the kingdom. Eli, even though he allowed the demonic activity to take place by his sons in the tabernacle, he did one thing right. He was a great mentor to young Samuel. And he mentored young Samuel in the tabernacle. You know, some people, they may fall short in one area, but God will use them in another area. We learn from Ezekiel 1 and 2 and 1 and 2 Samuel that God's glory can be removed. It's my prayer that the glory of this house will never be removed, that the glory will not depart. We may not do everything right here, but we get the glory right. I've heard it from coast to coast, from visitors, from members, from people who love God, that there's nothing like the presence felt in this place. And it is my prayer that the glory will not depart. But the word of God teaches us that God will remove the glory. If we put things in front of our relationship with God, it was idol worship during that day. Call it whatever you want in this day, but when we put anything in front of the manifest presence of God, the glory could be removed. Sin that goes on and on without being confessed or repented of can cause the glory to be removed. Rebellion can cause the glory to be removed. Taking the offerings of God's people and using it for your own gain can cause the glory to be removed. Let me take that one step further. Taking a paycheck from a place you don't love can cause the glory to be removed from a nation, from a home, from a church, and from a family. God does not play about certain things. He does not play about his word, his spirit, his house, or his people. And he's a God of grace, but there comes a time where if you turn your nose at him and his word and you turn your back on him, that he will remove the glory. In Ezekiel, we learn that it can be removed first from a nation. Everybody say nation. In Ezekiel chapter 8, it says, Behold, the glory of the God of Israel was there, chapter 11 of Ezekiel, and the glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city. God revealed the reason for the glory departing in chapter 8. He says, Son of man, do you see what they are doing? To make me go far away from my sanctuary. At the north altar gate was the image of jealousy in the entrance, chapter 8. Jealousy will cause the glory to be removed. Idol worship, as I've already said, will cause the glory to be removed. He saw 70 elders burning incense to idols, saying, The Lord, Ezekiel chapter 8, verse 12, does not see. In other words, we can get away with whatever we want to. 
the glory will be removed from a nation. They were worshiping the Greek God, Adonis. False worship, false gods, idol worship, and the glory departed. In chapter 9 of Ezekiel, it says that the glory went up from the cherub to the threshold. Then it goes on to say, then the glory went up from the cherub and paused over the threshold of the temple. There were sight and there were sounds accompanying the removal of the glory from a nation. Then the glory departed from the above. The threshold stood over the cherubim. Then from high above the cherubim, the glory departed from the city of Jerusalem and stood on the Mount of Olives, waiting for a people to repent, but they refused. See, God is gracious, but he will say, repent, turn, repent, come back to me, come back to me. But if we ignore his voice, the glory will be removed. It can be removed from a nation. Our text today in 1 Samuel reminds us that the glory can not only be removed from a nation, it can be removed from a home. 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 11 through 14. For I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knows, speaking to Eli. The sons of Eli were corrupt. They did not know the Lord. As I said, they were thieves. It caused the people to despise giving their offerings because of the way they treated the offering. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 22 says that Eli was very old and he heard everything his sons did, how they laid with women and how they stole the offering. Eli spoke to his sons, but they did not heed the voice of their father. And the Lord desired to kill them because of their disobedience. Chapter 4, when Eli was 98 years old and almost blind, a messenger told him his two sons were killed by the Philistines, that the ark of God, which represents the presence of God, was captured, and he fell off the seat backwards, broke his neck, and died. And in our text today, his daughter-in-law, after hearing that her husband had died, that her father-in-law had died, gave birth and named that child Ichabod, which means the glory has departed. So the glory of God can be removed from a nation. We're seeing that in our own nation. And if we don't repent, it will continue to be removed because it doesn't remove itself immediately. It's like a slow drip with an abundance of grace. It can be removed from not only a home, it can be removed from a church. It teaches us about the seven churches of, in Revelation chapter 2. It says this, If you do not repent, I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place. Not only can the glory be removed from a nation, a home, and a church, the glory of God can be removed from an individual. You remember Samson? Later in 1 Samuel, the nation, because of their own wickedness and their lack of faith in the priesthood, they desired a king. They wanted a king, and so God gave them a king by the name of Saul, very good-looking man. He was king, but because of his own jealousy towards the next generation, the glory was removed from Saul. It departed from Saul, and in came an evil spirit, is what the Bible says. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 27, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. It can be removed from an individual when we are jealous and we don't make way for a new generation. It can be removed from an individual, it says in the New Testament, when we quench the spirit or grieve the spirit. What does that mean to grieve the spirit? See, some people think suicide is the unpardonable sin. You know, it's not. Let me tell you what the unpardonable sin is, putting your mouth on a move of God because you don't understand it. And we're not to grieve the spirit of the living God with our words or our actions. It is a serious sin with serious consequences and it can cause the glory of God to be removed from individuals. I don't know about you, Abba's house, but I want to be 
a person of his glory. I want us to be a people of his glory. I want people to say of us a number of things, but first and foremost, that we're a place of his grace and glory where the spirit is moving, where God is doing things, where lives are changed, where the name of Jesus is lifted up. Without the presence of God, we would become like the Laodicean church in Revelation, wretched, poor, miserable, and blind. And I don't know about you, but I don't want that. The Bible says that Jesus longs for us to be a chosen nation a royal priesthood, his own special people, and that we may proclaim the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. I don't know about you, but I don't want the wretched, blind, poor, naked diagnosis. I want the chosen nation, royal priesthood, a special people diagnosis from the Father. So, if we're to be a place of glory, what does that mean? Well, it means that we have to be a place of worship. Worship. So what does the word worship mean? Quickly, biblical stuff. The Hebrew word for worship is abode, and the Greek word is latria, latreo. This is where we get our word worship. First and foremost, worship is presence, not preference. Worship is presence, not preference. We all have our preferences. There's nothing wrong with having preferences. You know, some of you like tomato, some of you don't. Some of you like mayonnaise, some of you don't. Some of you like him, some of you don't. None of that, it's not a sin to have a preference. I've got preferences. But if we become so focused on our preferences that we miss his presence, that's where the trouble lies. We've got to look beyond our preferences and our flesh and our worldly ideas and we've got to get to the throne room of God. The new Jerusalem. Worship is service, not style. Service, not style. When translated as worship in the Old Testament, the words there for worship have to do with work done in the temple and in the tabernacle. Latreia refers back to the Old Testament temple work that went on. It means work associated with sacrifice. So you can't call what you're doing worship just because you sing along once a week. It's a sacrificial lifestyle to be a worshiper, to be a person of God's presence. So it's presence, not preference, service, not style. It's sacrifice, not self. This goes against every natural thing in our DNA. Sacrifice, not self. We're to offer our bodies, what does it say in Romans 12? As a what? Living sacrifice, right? We're to present our bodies to God as a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is our spiritual service of worship. Moving on, worship is sowing, not reaping. The word also has to do with monetary gifts collected in the temple. Oh, Lord, there he goes talking about money again. You cannot do ministry without money. It is impossible to do it on a scale that pleases God. It costs money. But money is not our God or our source, it is a tool we use to advance the kingdom of God. Worship is intimacy. We've taught you this word many times, proskuneo. It means to kiss toward. It is a big sloppy kiss towards God. Both of these terms in the Greek refers to like a posture, a submissive posture, bowing down, in acknowledgement of God's sovereignty and humility, bended knee, all of those behaviors represent a lifestyle dedicated and consecrated to the Father. And that's what he's called us to. Ray Hughes talks about the sounds of creation and the sounds in our DNA. Each one of us has a sound specific to us. Did you know that God wants to use your sound? to bring him glory. It doesn't necessarily mean you have a gift in music, but you have a sound. 
and how you choose to release your sound is between you and the Father, but each and every person I'm looking at in this room and online, you are special, you are created by God, and you have a gift that God wants you to use to further his kingdom and advance his agenda, not yours. God longs to restore the tabernacle of David, which was 24 hours a day, praise and worship, prayer, anointing, and intimacy. He doesn't long to restore the tabernacle of Moses. That's religion. We have left Mount Sinai and we have come to Mount Zion, surrounded by angels. We've left the mountain of religion and now we're in the mountain of the new covenant. And God wants you to know that you have access because of his son Jesus to him 24 hours a day, seven days a week. As long as this earth remains, you can get a hold of God. Amen? Amen? You can get a hold of God in the shower, in the car, cutting the grass. You can get a hold of God in a prison cell. You can get a hold of God in a rehab. You can get a hold of God in a bar room. You can get a hold of God in a ditch. You can get a hold of God anywhere, anytime, any place. If you'll cry out for him, he'll answer you. So back to 1 Samuel. When we look at this story, first we see a nation in decay and in need of revival. Number one, a nation in decay and in need of revival. Eli was a dull and insensitive spiritual leader as the priest. He was dull and he was insensitive. And this is what the word of God said. It says, at that time, I will carry out against Eli everything I spoke against his family from the beginning to end. For I told him that I would judge his family forever because of the sin he knew about. His sons blasphemed God and he failed to restrain them. Therefore, I swore to the house of Eli, the guilt of Eli's house will never be atoned for by sacrifice or offering. How do we know he was a, a drunk or a, an insensitive leader to the things of the spirit? Well, when godly Hannah was crying out for a baby, he, he couldn't even sense the spirit on her. He accused her of being intoxicated. He missed the spirit of God. There's nothing worse for someone who wears a clergy robe or, or is a pastor or a bishop or whatever title they have to sit there and be so dull and insensitive they miss the power of God. They miss a moment with God. Listen, I, I may mess it up a million ways, but I don't want to miss God's spirit on my life or on your life. I don't want to miss what God's doing because I've grown dull. So he was insensitive. The priesthood was corrupt. We described the things his sons were doing that he allowed them to do, taking advantage of God's people, taking their money but not serving them in an appropriate way, stealing the money from the offering, those kinds of things. The priesthood was corrupt. Next, immorality was accepted. He knew his sons were sleeping with women and not doing the things that they had to promise God that they would do, but he allowed it. He said a little something, but he didn't want to create waves. That's why I repented to you earlier because sometimes my gift of grace has caused me to put up with hell too long. I want you to tell you that's over with. That's over with. I am no longer, because of grace, going to put up with rebellion, hell, or demonic spirits from anybody, staff or anybody. The word had become an afterthought in this nation. Sounds like the United States of America. You can wave any flag, do anything, but quote God's word in this country and it's a shame because this country was founded on the word of God and all the great institutions were founded on the scriptures of God. And now we've pulled the scriptures out of the courthouse and the schoolhouse and eventually they're gonna try to pull them out of the church house. And we need to repent if we want the glory to remain. The word was an afterthought. Now the boy Samuel ministered to the Lord before Eli, chapter three, verse one, 
and the word of the Lord was rare in those days. Don't take my word, right there it is in the scriptures. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no widespread revelation. Proverbs 29 verse 18 says, where there is no revelation, the people cast off restraint. But happy is he who keeps the law and knows the word. Number two, the nation was in decay. Number two, they rebelled against God. They rebelled against God. Rebellion, the Bible says, is as of the sin of witchcraft. Now, as a pastor, I've seen two kinds of rebellion. Rebellion with an attitude and rebellion with a religious smile. But let me tell you, they're both sins and they're both demonic. Some people will rebel smiling at you and some people, you know they're rebelling because they'll cuss you or something. But they're both wrong. Rebellion is a witchcraft at its finest. The first sin that really caused the glory to start to depart by Hophni and Phinehas was that they thought that they could implement something from the past to rescue them in the present. They thought what worked in the past could rescue them in the present. So they're fighting for their nation against the Philistines. They're getting their butts whipped. And these two ungodly sons of Eli said, hey, I know what we can do. Let's go back and get the Ark of the Covenant because in the past that worked. We're going to bring the ark into the battle and the Philistines, they're going to get so scared of God's presence, they'll just back up and quit. You see, what worked yesterday won't work today. And nothing will work if you are not right with God. Nothing you do will work if you are not right with God. Here's what it says in chapter 4. Now the Israelites went out to fight against the Philistines camped at Ebenezer and the Philistines at Aphek. The Philistines deployed their forces to meet Israel. And as the battle spread, Israel was defeated by the Philistines who killed about 4,000 of them on the battlefield. When the soldiers returned to camp, the elders of Israel asked, why did the Lord bring defeat on us today before the Philistines? Let us bring the ark of the Lord's covenant from Shiloh so that he may go with us and save us from the hand of our enemies. So the people sent men to Shiloh and they brought back the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord Almighty who was enthroned between the cherubim and Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. See, you can't take that which is impure and put it around that which is pure and expect a good outcome. So the people sent them to Shiloh. Hophni and Phinehas are with the ark. When the ark of the Lord's covenant came into the camp, all Israel raised such a great shout that the ground shook. See, don't ever think that just because something is loud, it's worship. See, some people think just because the volume's up, it's the presence of God. Come on, you gotta know the Lord better than that. I've been in loud environments that were full of hell. And you see, they shouted, but the motivation behind their shout wasn't pleasing to a holy God. Hearing the uproar, the Philistines ask, what's all this shouting in the Hebrew camp? When they learned that the ark of the Lord had come into the camp, the Philistines were afraid. A God has come into the camp, they said. See, they didn't even believe in their God. But they had more respect for what their God was capable of than Hophni and Phinehas did. What a sad day when people that don't even believe in God have more respect for his commands than we who are believers do. Oh, no, nothing like this has happened before, the Philistines said. We're doomed. Who will deliver us from the hand of these gods? They are the same gods who struck the Egyptians with all kinds of plagues in the wilderness. Be strong, Philistines. Be men. 
or you will be the subject to the Hebrews as they have been to you. Fight. So the Philistines fought and the Israelites were defeated and every man fled to his tent. The slaughter was very great. Israel lost 30,000 soldiers. The ark of God was captured and Eli's two sons died with the ark on the battlefield. So you have first the sin of presumption and then you move ahead to the sin of idolatry. Their hearts weren't after the one true God. See, Jesus must be the source of our worship. We must worship the one true God, not for what he can do for us, not for the victory he's promised to bring us, not for the outcome that we need, but because he's worthy to be praised, because he created the heavens and the earth, because he saved our souls, because he sent his son to die for us, because he's left us the Holy Spirit to comfort us and to guide us. He's worthy to be praised. And then the sorrow of Eli the sorrow of Eli he hears of his sons dying he falls off the back of his chair breaks his neck and he dies and I bet the last thing that went through his mind was I wish I would have done things different I don't know about you, but I don't want that to be the last thought that goes through my mind on my deathbed on the way to glory. I don't want to look back at my life and legacy and go, man, I wish I would have honored God's house. I wish I would have honored God's people. I wish I would have done things different. Listen, we all have regrets. None of us get it right all the time. But I believe God will trade our life of regrets and give us a life of faith. Faith that can move mountains. Faith that can cause you to overcome your struggles. Faith that can take you to a new level. A faith that's not stuck in yesterday. A faith that will propel you into your future. See, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of the Lord. Faith is believing in that which you can't see. And so you've got to believe that God can do it. Amen? But you can't just... Adopt the protocols and the procedure of religion and assume God will do it. See, that's what Hophni and Phinehas did. They thought, hey, we're going to grab something here from the past and it's going to work in the present. Wrong. Past victories don't equal presents. Programs don't equal presents. People don't even equal presents. You have to cry out for him if you want the authentic manifest presence of God on your life the sorrow of Eli you remember that old song I'm trading my sorrows I'm trading my shame yes. yes Lord yes Lord yes Lord yes are we trading our sorrows though for a life lived in the fullness of God 30,000 men were killed plus another 4,000 the army was defeated legacy died Eli's sons he lost his legacy the ark is captured and his daughter-in-law names the baby the glory has departed the glory has departed may that never be said of you that the glory has departed from your life as an individual or your family or your business or your church or your nation. How do we keep the glory from departing? How, how, do we, how do we steward the glory of God? How do we become faithful to the word? How can we maintain the glory? How can we maintain the glory? Well, it starts with us. Everybody say it starts with me. Absolutely. First thing we must do is repent. As I, I said, I wanted to repent publicly today, and I have. Because programs won't get it done. Good people won't get it done if they're not God's people. We have got to be about 
what God has for us next. First, we must learn from the past. Everybody say, learn from the past. The past is not your enemy. It's there to be learned from, right? So this story is in 1 Samuel leading to King David, which eventually leads us to King Jesus. That's where this thing ends. But this story is found in the first seven chapters of 1 Samuel. Why? Because we are to learn from the past. We don't want the glory to depart. So we must repent of our idolatry. We must put God first. We must learn from the past. Not only must we learn from the past, we must long for his presence. Long for his presence. I don't know about you, but I can tell the difference between a religious person and someone that's longing for his presence. Somebody that's longing for his presence will forgive They won't allow their emotions to overtake them. They won't operate in fear. They'll encourage the people around them. They'll support. They'll trust God with the outcome. That's somebody that longs for his presence. Learn from the past, long for his presence, and live in his presence. We're called to live in his presence. What does a presence-driven family member look like? I believe the Apostle Paul, when chained to a Roman guard, I believe he gave us the answer in Philippians chapter 2. May I go there with you as we close? How many of you like the answer to the question, how do we maintain the glory? Amen? Anybody? How many of you want the glory in your life? If you want the glory in your life, just shout yes. Yes. Just shout yes. yes. Here's what the Bible says. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. It starts in the mind. You've got to win that battle. Win that battle first. What you allow in your mind, what then comes out of your mouth can bless you or curse you. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking on the form of a bondservant. Coming in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient even to the point of death, even to the death of the cross. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Those in heaven, those on earth, those under the earth, they're all gonna confess that name. So we need to adopt the mind and the attitude of Jesus. What did he do based on the above scriptures? He did not consider his authority or anointing as something to be used for his own gain. He didn't take advantage of others. He saved the lives of others. He emptied himself taking on the form of a slave. He humbled himself is what it says in Philippians 2. He became obedient even unto death. This description is what God requires of his family. We must empty ourselves before we can truly be filled with his spirit. We must empty out all that the world has poured into us so that we can be an empty vessel and a clean vessel so the spirit of Jesus can fall in our lives. Listen, God doesn't pour his new wine in an old stinky wine skin. He pours it in an empty vessel. And you'll never get to where God wants you to get to until you empty yourself of your pride, your religion, your past, your opinions, your flesh. And then the new wine can come. God's called us to be seekers. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, to long for his presence, to learn from the past, to live in the presence of God. We're we're to be seekers. We're to be servants. We're to be submitted to the things of God. We're to be sowers. We're to invest in the lives of other people. We're to be solid in our theology and what we believe about the Bible. It's what it says in our text in 1 Samuel that the word had departed. You know, you can always count on when the word departs, the glory departs. 
We need to be solid in the word of God. We need to be stewards of grace and unity. This is the roadmap for spiritual joy. How could you be chained to a Roman guard with rats crawling across your feet, beaten to death, and write the greatest book on joy that's ever been written? Somebody say, the spirit of the living God. The glory of God came on Paul in a prison. And that's how we have Philippians. But the glory of God will come on you. He will change your life. Would you bow your head and close your eyes? Oh, I long for your presence, Father. Lord, I long for this to be a place of your presence. Lord, I just ask you, do exceedingly abundantly above all we could ever ask or think in this season. Empty us, Lord, and fill us with new wine. Pour your spirit out on our lives. Listen, if you're in this building under the sound of my voice and you don't know Jesus Christ, he's the source of all joy. He's the source of unity. He's the savior of the universe. He wants to have a relationship with you. It's not about how bad you've been, how good you've been, how religious you are. The Bible says all you have to do is confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. So if under the sound of my voice, whether you're online, watching this at a later date, or you're in the house today and you need Jesus Christ, you say, I'm done with my past. I'm ready to learn from my past and I want God's presence in my life. Just pray this prayer with me. Say, Lord Jesus, Lord, forgive me of my sins. Please come into my heart and save me. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and use me for your glory. If you prayed that prayer in just a minute, I want you to come down this aisle and I want you to tell one of these pastors. I'm going to have my pastors go ahead and make your way down. We're going to do the pledge at the end today. I feel the Holy Ghost will do it after. If you prayed to receive Christ, I want you to run down and say, look, I prayed to be saved. I want to be baptized next week. But for some of you, you are saved. But you haven't truly been in God's presence in a long time. Your relationship with him has grown cold. You've relied on programs and flesh and past victories for far too long. And it's hindered you from God's best. Y'all can go ahead and start ministering. Everybody's welcome. You go ahead and come on if you want. It won't bother me. That's what this is all about. Somebody give God some praise for her. Hallelujah. But some of you, listen, you, you've been operating with a spirit of fear, and I'm just going to let the spirit lead me here. You're so worried about everything that you're not allowing the spirit to be made manifest in your life. You're not seeking his presence any longer. So I ask you now, whether you need to make an altar out of your seat or you come down and you just wave at one of the pastors and you kneel down here, maybe you just take a few minutes to just give God some praise and invite his presence into your home, into your business. Pray for our nation. Pray for our leaders. Pray for those outside these walls who don't know Jesus pray that God would give you the boldness to invite, to invest, to share your faith, to make a difference in the lives of other people. Pray that you would have the mind of Christ, that you would seek things above, not earthly things, as it says in Colossians. Maybe God's saying you need to be a part of a presence-driven family and you've been attending and you've never joined a church before, but the Spirit's knocking at your heart and saying, you need to be a part of this church. Listen, we're a missing puzzle until your piece is added. We need you, the kingdom needs you, but only if God's calling you. Would you stand on your feet today? Heavenly Father, we long for your presence. We call it forth, miracles, signs, wonders, souls. Father God, may every person in this place, on this church roll, on this stage, on this staff, 
be a presence seeker. Lord, not performance, not programs, not opinions, but Lord, may every person on this staff be a presence seeker. May they long for you. May prayer be a daily part of their life. May intimacy be a daily part of their walk with you, Lord. May they spend time with you either in the evening or in the morning or all day walking in intimacy with you, praying, singing spiritual songs, praying the armor of God on their lives, the lives of their children, the lives of their family. Lord, teach us to look past this world and look ahead to your kingdom. We dedicate this word and this house to you, Lord Jesus. This is your house. It's your temple. It's your tabernacle. Sanctify it. Cleanse it. Do with it what you will today in the spirit. In Jesus' name. If you need ministry, you don't miss your moment as we lead in song. Don't miss your moment. All right. You can bring your pledges down after we do this. As always, I'm gonna do, we'll do the first statement together. Do we have it ready for the screen? All right. All right, here we go. Ready? I will be a worshiping family member. I will seek God's face in worship and long for his presence rather than focusing on my preferences and desires. I know I am not here to entertain or to be entertained, but to empty myself and be filled with his spirit. I will put Jesus at the center of it all. Amen.